Good morning, everybody. You guys awake? My name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here. Good to see all of you. Before we get going, um, Jerry, Jeremy McCullough and Cynthia Lane, I sense that you have something to confess before the church. Would you please stand up? What's going on? Um, Jeremy popped the question, and they're engaged. And if, if you would please just stop her today and look at this gorgeous ring that Jeremy created himself. It's just amazing. And I've been waiting for this for a long I'm sorry, Jeremy, but, you know, we've been waiting. And it's about time, buddy. So thrilled for you, too. Man, just so thrilled. Thank you. You can be seated, but. In case you're wondering, we don't make people stand up and confess their sins in front of the church. <laughs> if you're a guest here. Man, oh boy, I tell you what, what a good week, what a good week. Hey, listen, we are on our very last week of sit, walk, stand, going through the book of Ephesians. This is 23 weeks. If you're a guest here, we do very few four-week sermon series. Uh, we usually go through books, and, uh, and, we, and we do all sorts of stuff. Just so you know, we're going to start a message series in two weeks called Let's Get Coffee. And that's going to be a time for you to submit questions through the app. And you, you can ask questions like, how do I know I can trust the Bible is true? I don't know if you want to ask that question or not. You don't have to ask that question. How do I know Jesus was really resurrected? Uh, what did Jesus mean when he said, pluck your eye out and cut off your hand? Uh, what, you know, just whatever question you want to ask. Or maybe you have a question about culture, okay? About our culture. What, uh, I probably won't answer any political questions, okay? I just won't go there. Because my goal is to reach Republicans and Democrats, okay? So I probably won't answer those. But anyway, so think about that, okay? Next week, we're going to talk about moms. And, and before you get upset, if you're a person that wants to be a mom and you're not, will you please come anyway? Will you please come anyway? T next week's going to be terrific. It's going to be great. Okay, so we are on the last of the three parts of sit, walk, stand. Remember, sit was our identity in Christ. Paul spends the majority of the book talking about who we are in Christ. This is vital. Tonight, I'm going to speak with the youth about what is, what is identity. How do we find our identity? It's going to be at 5 o'clock. If you're a kid that doesn't normally come to youth, will you please ask mom and dad to take you tonight? Because I'm going to be talking about it, and it is the most important thing you can learn right now in your life. It's that important, okay? Second, we talked about walk, and how do I walk out this new identity that I have in Christ? And now we are learning that my identity will continually be attacked by the enemy. And so we have to learn how to stand against the assaults of the enemy. So Paul starts in Ephesians 6, verse 10, and says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. As I read these first three verses, I want you to, I want you to just notice how much it says stand. Okay? It doesn't say it here, but I want you to notice how often it says it. Now, what Paul is saying is he is referencing the battle, and the battle is in my head. You will, as a follower of Jesus, you will continually encounter a battle inside your brain. Okay? Now, you say, well, a battle. A battle. Like, um... You say, I'm not, I'm not a warrior. I'm, I'm just, I'm not the kind of person that likes hitting people. I hate guns. I'm just not a warrior. 
I'm a gentle soul. Maybe you agree more with Michael Jackson, that great philosopher, who says, I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. I, I just want you to hear this. The answer is that in order to battle, you've got to be a lover. And this really comes down to your love for God and love for others. And so please don't, please don't push this away, but I do want you to hear, if you're a gentle soul, it's time to suck it up and get tough and do some hard stuff. I'm, I'm sorry. You see, the greatest enemy to me, the greatest enemy to you overcoming is pictured right here. That's my pillow. Your pillow. Your pillow is your greatest enemy to becoming an overcomer. Guys, when I was in college, my roommate Fred loved to get up in the morning and spend time with Jesus. And he was trying to be as gentle as he could, but he was not gentle. He was coercive. And he would come in after taking a shower and he would turn on his hair dryer because it was the 1970s and guys hair dried their hair. How many of you 70s guys remember that? And, um, and he would walk over to me and blow it in my face while I'm trying to sleep. Hey, time to get up and pray. Then he would nudge me. Randy, time to pray. Old buddy. And I'd say, would you leave me alone? Well, just to get him off my case, I started getting up early. And friends, my life was transformed. My life was transformed. I want to promise you this. I want to promise you this. This, this message is about what has become a trite message, prayer and Bible reading. And it's become trite because people think that there's no power in it, and it's because people give up. I want you to understand that when you first start praying on your own, and when you first start reading the Bible for yourself, it will be difficult. It is hard. There's this thing called your flesh, and it fights against anything spiritual, and all of us start out there. I've asked several of my pastor friends, how long did it take you from the time you first wanted to start praying until prayer and Bible reading became life-giving. And the average answer is three years. That's what it took me. So I went three years starting my freshman year of college, and it was like checking off a checklist. I prayed. I did it. Something happened my junior year. The Bible became a different book. Jesus and I became best friends. Something broke through. Something happened. And I just need you to understand that when you first start doing this, it will be a battle. And you're not going to want to get up. And what you're going to hear is a voice that says, just pray in bed. You know how well that works? Lord, I just thank you for this day, and I just won't. You've got to rouse yourself and get up. If you need coffee, I highly recommend it. Hugh Hamilton is here. Hugh, Hugh discipled me in coffee when I was 40. I did not like coffee, and Hugh began teaching me the wonders of coffee. And, and I now am fully 
beyond pad one. Like I've become a Jedi in the whole coffee realm. And I just recommend it. Just drink your coffee and pray. If you need a shower, do whatever you need to do to get in there. And I just want you to understand it will be a battle. And it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Are you hearing me, friend? You have got to push through. You've got to push through. Don't let go. Just say to God, God, I'm not going to stop doing this till you show up. You say, Randy, you sound a little legalistic, like, you're, like you got, you've got to do this. I want you to understand what Dallas Willard, one of my favorite writers, says. He says, God is not opposed to effort. He's opposed to earning. You're not doing this for God to say, good boy, let me just, no, you're not, we don't do it for that reason at all. Listen, I do all sorts of stuff for my wife because I'm a well-trained husband and it requires effort. And I do do it for her to love me. I do it because she has trained me and, and I just need you to understand there are things you have to do in this life for love. This newlywed couple's looking at each other and just jabbing each other, laughing. She has spent some good time training this man. So, what Paul is talking about here is waking each morning and putting on the armor of God. And I, I don't want you to think of putting on the armor of God as a pantomime. Okay, God, here I am. I'm putting on the belt of truth. I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness. And, and you think that that's what, it, no, this, it, these are metaphors for something you do. Okay? It's much deeper than that. It's, it's interspersing a practice of obeying God and obeying His Word. It's, it's taking time in the Word and saying, in the, with, why you read the Word, what do I need to do with this today? How do I need to obey this? When the Word gets dry, I'm probably not doing what it says. So Paul says this, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, there's that word, against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We talked about this last week. There is a profoundly magnetic pull of lies coming against you every day from the spiritual realm. It is virtually every day. And it is a pull toward deception. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Have you ca- counted how many times it says stand? Now, it's interesting because we think of standing as a defensive term. I'm I'm taking my stand and I'm not moving. But if you read the Old Testament, many times stand is a reference to as not only defensive, but offensive. So this is both defensive and offensive kind of stuff. Stand, therefore. Did anybody see the stand? Having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, as we begin to talk about the armor of God, we may think Paul is modeling this on the average Roman soldier. And that's probably partly true. These guys are Ephesians, after all, part of the Roman Empire, and they've got soldiers in town, and they've all seen soldiers, and so that's partly true. Most scholars would say that the real model for Paul is Jesus himself. Isaiah chapter 11 begins by talking about the great Messiah, known in Isaiah 11 as the righteous branch, coming and making things right. 
and he's described as a mighty warrior. Most scholars believe that Paul's reference as a Pharisee who knows the Bible back and forward is referring to Isaiah chapter 11, where it says, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. And so this is a picture of Jesus. Once again, this battle is not one where we're actually hitting people, stabbing people, shooting people. In fact, it's not against people. It's against spiritual forces. And the armor is for me. I don't put the armor on other people. Okay? It's for me. So he says, stand therefore having fastened the belt of truth. What is the belt of truth? Belt is really not a good word. Frankly, the ladies will relate to this a little more. The word is closer to the word girdle. But it's not really like a lady's girdle that makes you look slim and svelte and beautiful. It's a, it's a girdle that is put around a soldier's waist that holds his sword. And sometimes when he needs to go fast, he's able to gird up his loins, which means put on the afterburners and go fast. So what is the belt of truth? Or the girdle of truth? It's absolute truth found in Scripture forming my worldview. I said last week that as a church, we believe that the Bible is absolute truth. Maybe you're here today saying, I don't believe in absolute truth, and I just want to remind you that that's an absolute statement. Okay? You just made an absolute statement. Um, friend, may I encourage you to just ask God to prove to you that the Bible is true? I, I just encourage you to ask him to prove it to you. I, I think we need that. You say, well, I can ask God that? You sure may, because he'll do it. I've asked my youngest son that. He's struggling with believing that the Bible is true. I said, well, you just tell God you don't, that's what you believe? Like, I don't know. I don't think I believe your Bible. So, so the belt of truth is absolute truth that forms my worldview. What does the Bible say about Jesus? What does the Bible say about God? What does the Bible say about love? What does the Bible say about sex? And do I believe that? No, do I, do I believe that? Now, the second part of the belt of truth is not just absolute truth, but it's experiential truth, which comes from God showing me his faithfulness as I walk with him day by day. You know, I, I just need God to show me truth as I go through every day of my life. Lord, is this true? Lord, your Bible says that wisdom is better than jewels and better than gold. Lord, will you show that to me? Will you show that to me? Help me to experience that. Help me to experience that you are with me in trials. How, will you prove to me that you're with me in trials? So the belt of truth is vital because the enemy comes at me with lie after lie after lie, and I have to go back and say the truth. The breastplate is in the same sentence. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, it's this plate that covers my, my body, my heart, 
my guts. And I just, I want to say this again. Teenagers, we're talking about this tonight because I need to understand my identity in Christ. The breastplate covers the most vulnerable parts of me besides my head. It's vulnerable. Now, what is righteousness? If you've been here very long, you know Randy Craning talks about righteousness all the time. Just call me Righteous Randy. And I'm righteous because of what Jesus did for me, not because of anything I earned. But what does righteous mean? It, it is the cry of the human heart. Did you know that you will define your identity either by right standing with Jesus or by some sort of inferiority or rejection? It's one of the two. So right standing means I have no inferiority. When I come before the God of the universe, the God of the universe who is holy and righteous, because Jesus gave me his righteousness on the cross, I can boldly come to him and ask him what I have need of because I have no inferiority. I'm his kid. It means no remembrance of former sins. The enemy wants me to remember and remember and remember. Guys, I, I have a tendency to get in the bath daily and bathe in my regrets. Does anybody else have a problem with that kind of bath? Like, I just have a tendency to go, oh, Lord, I remember when I did this. I remember when I said this. Uh, and, and, and the Lord has to just continually remind me, I forgot about that. I've separated that from you as far as the East is from the West. I've removed that from you. You are now in Christ, and that is no longer who you are. God looks at me in Christ, who was his righteous son, making me his righteous child. And I have to put that on daily. Lord, thank you that you've made me right before you through the blood of Jesus. Thank you that even though it's really easy for me to remember my former sins, I just want to say thank you that I stand before you right because of Jesus. And it also means that I'm always, always, always welcome. Even if I just sinned, I'm welcome. You say, Randy, that's blasphemous. No, that is basing, if you base your righteousness on your own righteousness, you'll never stand. It's all on his. He did this in me. Now, I want to quote something from you, and you're going to think it's blasphemous at first because so many of us are based in guilt. And you say, well, Randy, I grew up with Catholic guilt. Well, I grew up with Baptist guilt, and it's just as bad. I just need you to hear that. Now, let me make this quote. Are you ready? It's going to shake you up. Jeremiah L. Johnson says, spiritual maturity is not a process of working on your sin. It is a process of you discovering your righteousness. I'm waiting for you to snap a picture of that slide because uh, that's going to mess with you. We, we think we're on this journey of working on our sin. You know how many guys I talk to who say, yeah, I'm working on that one. And I just want to tell them, stop that. Just stop it. You working on it is your effort. Go back to remembering what he did on your behalf. He gave you right standing. And go back and thank him for right standing. Quit saying, I'm working on that. Did you know that we live on the Sabbath day and we enter into his rest as we say, I'm going to quit working on my sin and I'm just going to rest in Jesus? Jesus. 
Okay. Then he goes on, he says, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So the shoes are not just the gospel of peace, but my readiness to share the gospel. Let let me ask you just a quick question. Do you feel like if someone asked you, how do I give my life to Jesus? Do you think you could say it in 30 seconds or less? If you can't, you probably don't have shoes on because you've not prepared yourself to be able to say it. I remember flying from New York City to Kazakhstan, Central Asia, and a lady in front of me began talking to me, and she said, you're a pastor? I said, yeah, that's right. Would you mind telling me what it means to be born again? Well, we started talking. I found out she came from a church that teaches that you don't have to be born again. You just have to do these seven sacraments. And and if you do these sacraments, like be baptized as a baby, get married in the church, uh, take communion every week, um, do you know, do all these things. And and they just say being born again is not part of our church, even though it's something Jesus said that you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven without being born again. Do you know how to help someone understand what it means to be born again? Without being preachy, without being arrogant and judgy, do do you know how to do it? As a church, we're going to start helping people understand how to do that. just want to let you know that. Do you understand the power of your story? Do you understand that while you're hanging around the water cooler with people at work, while you're doing stuff with friends, is it is it natural for you to say, oh boy, I relate to that. Man, I I just, you know, I yeah, I, I just I just think about my friend Roger. A couple of my other friends who have spent time in jail. And they just openly go, yeah, I kind of learned about that in jail. And, and they talk about how Jesus met him in jail. It's authentic. It's not fake. You, you don't act like you're somebody special because you did nothing to deserve your salvation. But your story can transform people. Have you, have you got your story ready so that you can share it in about a minute or less? Have you, like, sometimes when you're hanging out around a campfire, have you got it ready to share with people for about 15, 20 minutes? You know, I remember when we planted our church, before we even started having services, we had about 15 people over to our house on a weekly basis. And most of them had no idea who Jesus was. And we began just saying, tell us your story of your life. You know, people love telling their stories of their life, and virtually none of these people uh, talked about Jesus. It was all about, well, I was born at a very young age, and things just went along really well, and I, and this happened, and this happened, and, and they just tell their story, and, and they just love doing it. I mean, man, everybody couldn't wait to get there for the next person to tell their story. Finally, Gay and I told our stories, and our stories were full of Jesus. And I remember two of the guys walking up to me afterwards and saying, you know, your stories are really different than our story. <laughs> like you've, like God's really a big part of your life. That was their observation. And I just wonder if you have your story ready to tell to somebody. Are you willing to listen more than to preach? Are you willing to say, tell me your story? 
I'd like to hear your story before I tell mine. You know, the best witnesses are people that listen more than they talk. Doesn't that make you feel better? Some of you are going to go home relieved. It's about being a listener. Then Paul says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, this, this noun, shield, is an interesting thing. It literally means a door thing. Put on the door thing. In, in Greek, it's literally put on the door thing. Which proves that this was written in the first century because the shields were huge doors in the first century. And these guys would get in these phalanxes of, of soldiers and they would close all the doors all their shields, and they would only let in whatever they wanted to let in. And so later on, the Roman shield became smaller because they became more individualistic in their fighting. So this is all about me holding up the door and not allowing the flaming darts of the enemy to come in. And man, when you, when you watch these first century Romans and all these, all these what they're called barbarians coming after them with swords and shields, and they go, shields up, and they put their shields up, and then guys that have shields above those and shields above those, and they just, they just hit this shield wall and bounce off of it. They couldn't do anything. The flaming missiles of the enemy couldn't get through. And so... The idea is I'm holding up this shield of faith and I just want to say thank you, Lord, that what I'm hearing right now is not truth. The devil's telling me how inferior I am and I choose truth. Finally, we have the helmet of salvation. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Isn't that interesting? The thing that covers my head, which is where the battle is, is my salvation. Just knowing that I belong to Jesus. Have you come to that place? Of course, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And guys, I just want to say that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and this is the Word that you've hidden in your heart. I'm sorry, part of, part of the hard thing is putting the, the Word in your heart and memorizing it. You say, I hate memorizing. Learn to love it. You say, I, I, I refuse. Okay, well, um, that leaves you without a sword. and you're gonna need it. Then finally, Paul says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. This is something you can only do when you've allowed the Holy Spirit to teach you to pray. Have you come to that place? Have you come to this place where you've learned to pray at all times in the spirit, like letting the Holy Spirit lead your prayer? I've got to cut it short today, so I'm going to skip a couple slides, Alan, sorry. Let's talk about the take-home. Let me ask you this question. How much of my life is centered around prayer and the reading and meditating of the Word? Like, is this, is this a standard in my life? And not because I got to, but because I get to. Can you answer that question for yourself? And second, am I prepared to do the hard thing and begin to make it a priority in my life to pray and be in the Word? Like, I, I've got to wake up earlier. If I'm going to start the day right, I've got to put on the armor. I've got to pray. Let me close with this quote from Stalina Goodwin. 
When your adversary turns up the heat, consider a compliment and proof that you not only belong to God, but are moving in the direction he has called you to. The enemy isn't chasing anyone he already has. Can I ask you to just pray with me? Father, I just want to invite you to empower me to begin a life of resisting the enemy and submitting to you. Will you teach me to be in regular, deep fellowship with you? Would you have your way in me? Help me to pray the price. And you paid the price. But I just pray that you'd help me just to push through and allow you to show yourself to me truly. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.